Hello, and welcome everybody to day two of the Habitat for Humanity New York City Women Build Summit. Um, I hope you, you were with us yesterday and you enjoyed a wonderful dynamic conversation with some great Habitat for Humanity New York City and Westchester County leaders. Um, and we're happy to welcome you here to day two and we have, it promises to be another bold conversation uh, with a number of my favorite people, old and new. Um, so uh, Habitat, let me tell you a little bit first uh, before I introduce the panel about Women Build really and, habit and what it means to Habitat. Um, Women Build is not about excluding men. What it is about is really about elevating the role of women and talking about the ways in which women interact in the policies and systems and in their world to change their world. And, you know, I may be biased, but, you know, women rock. And uh, if you, in our sector, if you look at affordable housing, women rule. Uh, there are an awful lot of women uh, driving for affordable housing in uh, New York City. Um, so women build for us look like on site building, can look like women working together on a build site, wearing construction hard hats and, and wielding paint brushes and hammers. Um, or it can look like uh, a virtual women build summit. One of the things that I, I am passionate about about Women Build is I think that women, specifically, arguably New Yorkers in general, crave authentic conversation. And that's what really this Women Build Summit is about, an opportunity to bring really interesting and interested people, women, together to have really authentic conversation. I often say, I said yesterday that, you know, I'm a New, new New Yorker. I've been here six years now. I'll always be a new New Yorker. Um, and uh, that's the rules. That's you know, what you sign up. And, um, and what I notice is you can come and go into these events around New York City, business events, etc. And you come in and you leave and you don't really know anybody any differently than potentially you did when you sat down. And so our, our goal is to really um, is to, to use this pandemic to, to bring people together, women together, to have authentic conversations. So um, without further ado, um, oh, actually one more further ado, I need to thank the sponsors. Always thank the sponsors. Um, this kind of event and the work that we do at Habitat for Humanity in New York City would not be possible without the philanthropic support of great corporations, individuals, passionate supporters like you. So thank you for agreeing to sign on and be part of this uh, event with us. Thanks also to RTW Foundation for providing funding that um, allows us to host this in a virtual format, a little upgraded for the viewer experience from your traditional Zoom. Um, thank you to Mega Contracting. I, I you know, have a total bias towards mega contracting. They're such great partners to us. EQT partners and to ASHRAE, which is a trade association for HVAC um, and AC professionals and really uh, a meaningful contributors to our work here in Habitat. So thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to the people, the individuals out there in the audience who uh, signed on to be with us today. Um, so Without further ado, I'm going to bring on uh, the panel and we will get the conversation, get the party started, as they say. Um, mm -hmm. So let me bring on first Karen Boykin Towns, CEO of Encore Strategies and Vice President of the NAACP Board of, uh, National Board of Directors. Welcome, Karen. Thanks for joining us. Karen, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having me and I'm thrilled to be here this morning. Do you mind, I want to ask everybody as they join us, what brings you to this work? What brought you to your role uh, in life? That's probably a long, you know, a long story, but maybe you could give us a thumbnail sketch. Well, I, I guess it's, you know, a few decades in the making. Um, I, if I'm honest, I can't say that I planned it like this. Um, in my joining the NAACP, never did I think I would be elected to the National Board of Directors and never, ever what I have thought that I would have been elected to be chairman of the board. Um, but I think that is through uh, hard work in terms of being willing to do the work and being open to opportunities as they presented themselves and being willing to do more work is really how I've gotten here. Isn't that the truth? That's the, <laughs> that's the, that's the un, unspoken hook to being open to opportunities is it brings along more work. Well, we're yeah. very glad you could here. Thank you, Karen. Um, next up, uh, I am honored to introduce Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Everybody who is in the green room already knows that uh, 
that Gail is a personal hero of mine, and I say this all the time, and I am not blowing smoke. Uh, and if you are not familiar, once you're familiar with Gail, she'll be a personal hero of yours too, I guarantee you. So Gail, we are truly uh, honored um, for you to be part of our Women Build uh, panel today. Well, thank you very much, Karen. Uh, I want Karen Boykin Towns to know that everybody knows her and nobody would be surprised that she would be not just vice chair, but the head of the NAA and <laughs> just knows what else. So let me be clear. We always joke because she's married into a family, but she's actually better than the family that she married into. I'm just telling you. That's, that's me talking. Um, but to, to and I'm add, originally from Manhattan. I know, so no. I, I'm letting it go. She's not from Brooklyn originally, just so you know. We all say that. It's not just me. That's like everybody says that. Um, but I am the borough president now. I was on the city council in the past, and I've worked uh, in a little bit in affordable housing, uh, not knowing half of what some of the other panelists knows, but I did work for Telesis Corporation for a little while. They do some of the uh, affordable housing around the country. Um, and then I worked with uh, Mayor Dinkins uh, with his federal office. That was an interesting time and we miss him uh, very much. Um, and then um, before that, uh, working with uh, Ruth Messenger when she was in the city council. But to be honest with you, I got started with women because uh, I was head of something called then the National Women's Political Caucus in New York. And that was, it was all five boroughs statewide, nationally for a while, helping women get elected around the country um, and around the state in my situation. And that's how I first got elected to the city council. It was uh, Ruth Messinger helping me. It was women from the National Women's Political Caucus. And I remember my very first fundraiser was all women. So I, I never forget that that's what my base is. And I'm always deeply, deeply appreciative. But I got into it because I believe in government and government has to be what it's supposed to be, which is the uh, backbone, um, the place where you go when everything else is failing you, as well as picking up the garbage and making us, keeping us safe and um, making sure that the fires and all the other uniform service work. But it, it, it has, I think in the recent times, gotten a little bit um, less helpful sometimes to people. It's a safety net. But it has to be better safety net and, and easier to access. And that's why I'm in government, is to try to do that. <clears throat> thank you, Gail. I, honestly, I could get lost in you talking. And uh, um, so thank you for that. I'm, and you have such an interesting personal story, too, that I'm only a little bit aware of. So hopefully we'll get a little more of that New York background out as, as we go forward. But let me introduce now Dewana Williams. Um, super proud to welcome Dewana. Um, uh, a sister in affordable housing here, and um, and thank you for for being part of this incredible panel, Duana. Hi, Karen. Thank you for having me. I'm so honored to be present with you and these esteemed panelists today. Um, briefly, I, well, I'm the managing principal and founder of Debar Development Partners. We are um, developers of multifamily housing. We do focus on affordable housing. And um, I'll share my early spark, early interest in housing. Um, I was raised by a single parent. Um, my mother and I lived in Atlanta, Georgia, and we lived in a very modest apartment building. She grew up um, kind of middle class with two parents, um, but she became pregnant in college, had me, and was on her own. She really wanted to provide me what she grew up with and save to buy her first home. And I was about nine mm -hmm. years old by the time she was able to do so. And we had our first mother-daughter disagreement, if you will, at that time, because she narrowed down her list to two houses. Uh, one was in a community that she really loved and thought was special. The other was in a community that I really loved and thought was special. Um, of course, it was her money, so she won the argument. <laughs> and I'm the mother, because I'm the mother, right? She was the mother. <laughs> and, um, but what happened was it really piqued my interest in real estate. I, I kind of became a little bit of a real estate nerd and started studying property values and appraisals. And it just really grew um, over time. And I started going to, she permitted me to go to foreclosure auctions and things like that. So that was really my first interest in real estate. Um, and I, I then went to a women's college. So between my mother being a, a very strong single parent and going to a women's college, I've always been interested in women leadership and then also as well, real estate. And I can share more later. 
Oh, thank you very much. That's really interesting. That's not a lot of people, uh, not a lot of children or, or young people are interested in foreclosure auctions. I love what that says about you. But let us bring on uh, last and certainly not least, uh, Pastor Demetria Barrios uh, from Brooklyn, um, who is joining us today. And a shout out to De Demetria's mother, who I know is in the audience. Um, and so it is all about, it's all about legacy and women power today. So I want a big shout out to you uh, uh, for being with us today. And thank you, Pastor, for being part of us. It's so important. Um, you represent the faith community and the, and the underpinnings of everything that Habitat is about and the ecumenical nature of bringing us all together. So thank you for being here. Yes, it's, it's absolutely my pleasure. Um, I feel so honored to be around all these amazing people. So thank you. Uh, for inviting me into a new family because this feels like home. When I'm hearing the voices and what is happening in the hearts of everyone, I'm like, oh, I belong here. So thank you so much for you guys sharing and welcoming me in. I can go back to when I was a kid, a story that was told about me when I was very young, that if there was someone that was very well-dressed that would come up to me and say hi, I would kind of turn my head away and I wouldn't be interested. But if there was like a homeless person who came up to me or a wino, as it was called back then, someone who was addicted to alcohol would come up, I would be overjoyed and reach my hand out to touch them. And just from a young age, I was told that I have eyes for the broken. And I wasn't raised in the church. So when I was um, welcomed into the church when I was 20 and I got saved, I realized that Jesus was actually the person that was in me, that was causing me to have this heart for people. So I wanted to share the news about the church and that God is a God of the brokenhearted. And I realized that the church kind of had a bad reputation, a reputation for keeping women down, for oppression and all of these things. And it bothered me. And I felt like God called me on an assignment to plan a church myself and to partner with other churches in the city to help with reconciliation with the church in the city to help people understand that the church is a place of refuge. So a part of that is, is me just really living out the gospel first and helping people understand that God cares for the city. He always has, um, and he always will. So I pray to just be a voice into that for whoever is willing to listen. Wow. We could almost sort of say, thank you very much. Good night right now. Can we like, that was, <laughs> thank you for that pastor. That was amazing. That is, there's so much there. I'm looking forward to hearing more. Um, so thank you again to all the panelists really for making yourself available. Um, so, you know, we have a couple of things. There's so much on the table and, and I feel desperately unprepared to the task given that we could talk for ages about all of this stuff. But I, let's start with, let's start with this notion of women. I mean, this is about, um, you know, interestingly or not, um, not by design, but by reality. Habitat's Women Build program in New York City, more than 90% of our home buyers are single female heads of household. And that is not by design. That is just because I think it's a testament to the power of women. Again, we're not about excluding men. It is a bit of an indictment on the male portion of the species, I will say, but, it, but I prefer to focus on this, the aspect of women faced with creating shelter for themselves are the people, the women who roll up their sleeves and get busy. Um, so as you, I mean, this, I'm sure that doesn't surprise any of you that women are 90% of our, our women are home buyers, but um, in your respective careers, what, you know, how do you unpack this issue of women? It wasn't so terribly long ago that none of us could get a loan without our, or a credit card without mm -hmm. a co-signer or without, or, you know, or God forbid, um, buy a home. So, you know, as we in 2021 address this issue, what are some areas where you're addressing squarely the issue of, you know, gender um, and women and empower, and I don't like the word empowerment, but I'm going to use it here. You know, how do we elevate women? Um, Karen, do you, do you mind starting us off with something like, what's, what, uh, what are you up to in that space? Um, well, uh, no, certainly not surprised. And, um, uh, the Harvard Business Review recently cited that 80% of household decisions are made by women. So what we know is women are the bedrock, the backbone certainly of our homes, of our community, of our churches, of our organizations, period, point blank. 
um, uh, from, I'll speak from the perspective of the NAACP, you know, we were founded in 1909 and um, women from our very beginning were part of the leadership of bringing it uh, to fruition. Mary White Overton, Ida B. Wells, um, today even, um, over 40% of our national board of directors, which are made up of 64 people, over 40% are women. And this is the cutest thing. I think the biggest thing, um, which I just love every time I get to say it, um, you know, everyone knows our president is Derek Johnson, um, um, our president and CEO. However, his leadership team of eight, um, seven are women. He is the only one that is a male on our leadership, on, on the leadership team. And I mean, it just goes to show the, uh, that women have uh, served an integral role uh, within the history of the NACP and does to this day. Um, and from a personal perspective, I'll just say that, you know, right now, um, or the last year, you've seen a real focus as it relates to getting women on boards and, you know, Black women in particular, Black and Brown women in particular. And um, earlier this year, um, I got my first corporate board and that was great. And then I was contacted about another board. It was a Fortune 500 board um, in the 200s or so, I won't name the name, um, a good company, but it really wasn't a good fit for me, right? Um, and with everything I have going on, I'm very particular in the things that I uh, get aligned to. Um, but instead of me saying, thank you, but no thank you, um, and they just met me, I gave them a list of three other women who I thought Great. would be exceptional. They had not gotten their first board opportunity, um, but they are phenomenal women. And I am like tickle, tinkle, picked. Today is Wednesday, right? Today's Wednesday. So one of them is actually meeting with the full board today um, because she's gone through the process and the deal will probably get sealed today. And so certainly, um, you know, we look to lift as we climb and being able to find opportunities, not just for me, but for other women is definitely something that I take pride in doing and um, I think is important for all of us to, to, to see where we can influence some of these decisions that are being made. That's amazing, Karen. Lift as we climb. You might hear me say that again in the future sometime. I oh, I did not make it. I'm, I'm sure someone else has said it before me. <laughs> um, but that is amazing. And there's so much there just in saying, you know, in first of all, in making the decision for yourself that says, thank you, but no, thank you, or thank you, I've got too much on my plate, but this idea of lifting other women is just tremendous. Um, Gail, I want to, I feel compelled to go to you. I mean, with the, the role of women in the political machine that is New York City, um, I'm really interested in your perspective, um, you know, historically, and, and maybe even as a look to the, towards the future. I mean, um, I, I'm really curious about your, your, your perspective about women and leadership in New York City. Well, first of all, Sharon's story is phenomenal because we've all been trying to get women and women of color on these boards. And um, it took, uh, I think, this some of the discussions during the pandemic, some of the rallies, some of the pushing, because even though people are often talking about grassroots issues, um, the same issue has been going on forever on trying to get more women of color on these boards and has not been successful. So now what's happening is the pension funds, and I sit on the New York one, they're starting to say, if you do not, we're not going to invest. So you have to talk, uh, you know, really where uh, the information counts and certainly investments around the country, other states are doing the same thing, other uh, municipalities. So that would be an example of something positive that's been happening in the last uh, couple of years where um, it's where the pocketbook hits the road. And, and so that's a, an example of something positive. I, am a, I just wanna say this pandemic has it, hopefully the new the new normal is not the past normal in terms of women because if it's true and again I you know I read the papers so I read the same kind of statistics that you heard earlier but women really got out of the workforce you read it very clearly in the papers I, I see it too I mean women have always as Karen indicated been you know the backbone of the political clubs the backbone of the civic associations the backbone of the block associations etc. Um, and there is a you know, rule in New York, uh, not elsewhere, that you have to have one 
woman and one man in terms of district leaders and state committees. Mm -hmm. But if that didn't exist, there would probably be mostly men. So mm -hmm. because the women would be the uh, in the background. So that's positive. Now we have to worry, uh, you know, figure out the trans issue because that's another issue that's important. Um, uh, and the non-binary. But the fact of the matter is in government, I think the new normal, if that's the right term, has to include what we've been saying for years, full childcare, free, affordable, early, um, and also after school. I actually have schools in the borough of Manhattan, elementary, that don't have after school programs. And then we just had a big fight about where there will be slots for Head Start, et cetera, without getting into all the specifics. That shouldn't even be discussed. I am excited that Ai-jen Poo, who's my favorite organizer, she's been organizing domestic workers for years and now she's in Chicago. I believe she's one of the people that if this infrastructure bill passes, and who knows, I hope it does, yeah. it will include childcare. It will include um, support for the family, not just we need it for the bridges, we need it for the subway, but we also need it for the family. That's part of infrastructure. That would be a first. So those kinds of government apparatuses would not be taking place, I think, unless there were women involved. Now you can also say elected wise, we, you know, we don't have uh, many women in the city council. That's been ongoing in terms of the past. When I was there years ago, there were more, but it slipped. Um, I think the numbers are increasing in Albany, but I don't know exactly. And of course the country is increasing, um, mm -hmm. but it has to be 50%, it's not 50%. So everywhere women should be elected the same number as men, a little bit more because there are a few more of us. And, and so that's, but I'll tell you something interesting and I think Karen would agree with me. I always find my best support mechanisms. Yes, women in elected office, although sometimes there's tension, I'm gonna be honest with you, it's not a perfect mix. Um, I have friends, male and female, but you know where I have a lot of friends, and, and I think elders will agree, women who are appointed, because when women are appointed mm. to commissioners and appointed, like, I'm making this up, like, Dr. Dukes, head of the NAA in New York, or head of a civic organization like you at Habitat, I always find that's a really wonderful, as an elected person, I'm trying to get work done, I'm trying to find a way to accomplish you know, whether it is after school, housing, et cetera. So I find the appointed or the women who have succeeded in heading up organizations, those are my uh, best colleagues. It's an, it, I never, you never hear much about it because you hear about elected women or you hear about women who are colleagues of yours at, at Habitat and so on. But there is a very nice uh, bond, I think, for women who are appointed in government or uh, nonprofits or for profits. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I find my best bond. Sometimes women, other women elected office, we're, sometimes we get along and sometimes we don't. Yeah, I mean, that's, I guess that's the reality, right? We don't have to get, we don't, don't all have to get along for sure. Um, there's what, so much what, there, Gail, it's, there's just so much there that I'd love to unpack. I mean, I love what you had to say about childcare. And, and so I mean this with, this is a double-edged sword, but I'm going to say it. Why is childcare a women's issue? I mean, there are two people involved in creating children Yet it is a women's issue because women are, you know, again, women are traditionally the child carers. I'm not indicting, you know, I love men. Lots of, some of my best friends are men, as the saying goes, but why is that a women's issue? And yet well, it, it became, is, it'll be women who get it over the, over the finish line if we get it became, there. It became very clear during this pandemic. Yeah. I mean, yeah. most of the young people, students were at home. They were not in the school. That's a whole other topic, but they were home and guess who got stuck? working with their activities on Zoom. And as a result, I think it's a national issue. I shouldn't just pick on New York. And so who got out of the workforce? Yeah. Those women. And th that's just clear. So that's why the new normal has to be support from very early age, all the way through whatever is appropriate in terms of uh, support after school, childcare, et cetera. That's, it, I don't think that's gonna change. What could change is government doing the right thing and putting the money in to do it. That's what should change. And also I think it's better for the student to have that kind of academic support. So Absolutely. I think it's a, it's a win-win, but for some reason, no support, no surprise, we haven't done it in the past. Right, it feels like, you know, it feels like we're, the winds are headed in the right direction, although we, you know, yeah. there's a lot that can blow us off course as we, uh, as we know. Um, 
And thank you. Uh, thank you, Gail, so much there. Joanna, you know, I said when we were, when we, uh, when we, we signed on, um, you know, the affordable, uh, maybe little known fact, maybe well known fact, in the affordable housing space, in particular in New York City, um, and in the region, so many women uh, leaders, so many leaders are women. And, um, and, and of course, there is a focus on MWBE and all of that. But there's, it's, there's, a, there is a real tranche of women that have set their sales and, and set their career by providing affordable housing and how in the housing space. Um, do you, I mean, it's not surprising to me, I don't know uh, what your thoughts are, your experiences have been there. Sure. Um, so, so a couple of things. Um, first, Karen, if you um, have any more corporate boards that you're turning down, you can send them. <laughs> <out. laughs> that's my, my goal. I need to get on a corporate board too. You know? <laughs> well, that's one thing. Um, a, a second thing uh, that um, that Gail was just mentioning in terms of the disproportionate burden of childcare. I, I do want to make one quick point about that. Um, when I moved to New York um, and started not just developing, but also looking for places to live, I noticed that there were no washers and dryers, not just in affordable apartments, but in regular market rate apartments, no washers and dryers in apartments. And that's not something in Georgia that, you know, you would normally see, I guess, because we have so much space. And I determined at that point that as I built affordable housing, I wanted to include things like washers and dryers and dishwashers, for example, yeah. in the apartments, because it is a burden that is disproportionately wrought by women. It takes away just from our time and our ability to do other things. And it, that issue has really been exacerbated as we're talking about during COVID because mm -hmm. the women, the people who stayed home were disproportionately women and disproportionately to caring for children. And, you know, historically speaking, the people developing and building these homes have been men and who haven't had a concern for how this actually functions in a home. So wow. if you go to a basement to do the laundry, for example, um, which is where a lot of these, uh, for affordable housing, a lot of these um, washers, and, washers and dryers are located, then you're really talking about a life safety issue. If children are left unsupervised while you leave the home in order to wash clothes or to dry them, then anything could happen, it's a hazard. Um, you at least want to have something within the apartment or across the hall or on the same floor in order to alleviate um, the, this life, self, life health, safe, healthy issue. Um, and so to me, it's really an issue of, in this, in this age of DEI, this is really an issue of equity. Um, and mm -hmm. it's something that I have really doubled down on during COVID. But moving on to your question regarding um, women in real estate. Yes, there are many women joining the, the real estate development world, as well as other areas of real estate, um, be it brokering, um, investing, property management. And it's wonderful to see. It's something that has, I think, proliferated more over the past 10 years. Um, and there are organizations now that supporting women, supporting women um, in construction and other areas. So there are more of us, we are leading more, and I think we're going to see better housing, different kinds of housings, different, different considerations, like I just mentioned, because of the women that are now leading um, in real estate. I think you're right. I think, you know, you, you know, we've talked about the youth, the children end of the spectrum, but you think also about aging parents and kind of generational impact of, of housing and some of the strategies that are going on in New York City and, and um, and around the world around ADUs and accessory dwelling units or additive to an existing unit of housing that can act as a generational support, which again, kind of loops around into the childcare element. Maybe if you've got the grandparents on board, um, so much there again. Um, you know, Pastor Dimitra, I, I really, um, I, I loved what you said in your introduction around the, I mean, so much of us, uh, so many of us with experience in various faiths um, have biases around how various faith practices have treated women. I mean, I think that's probably a fair statement. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but, uh, but I loved what you said there because let's just name it. I mean, I think the faith, faith component as an institution has been small d discriminatory. Um, but yet look at the power base of the, of women in in churches, I mean, I said um, full disclosure. I said in uh, in the in, I've said numerous times in the last number of years. If we wanted this pandemic 
uh, the distribution of vaccine vaccines to ha be handled efficiently. Get involved with women in the churches. Get involved with the black led uh, female black led churches. That's how we would have gotten vaccines out. We'd have been having vaccinations with our mm. with our coffee, you know. And um, so there's there's a discriminatory aspect, and then there's this um, power base that is that those of us who are close to the action on the ground, we know that's how things get done. I mean, with all respect within a refined government program, but I'm just, I'm curious about your perspective uh, in the faith community and your faith community. Yeah, um, I'm a lead pastor of Legacy Brooklyn. So I lead alone as a female lead. And that is very, very rare um, in the church circles that I'm in. So it was very important to me to ask God some questions, like why did he put this inside of me and what did he want me to do with it? And it was pretty clear that he wanted me to seek out other women. And I think that's really important that we just don't wait for women to come and just say, hey, are there any positions of authority? There are a lot of female leaders out there that we need to be looking for because they just have a mindset that they're not good enough. They don't see themselves fitting in certain scenarios. So a big part of what I felt like God was doing in me is helping me see how important that voice was. So what Legacy does intentionally is seek after women. We're looking for them, especially the ones who are timid in the back, who probably don't know their potential and power. Um, and we seek them out and we introduce ourselves to them and we tell them that there are things that they can do to continue to see how powerful they are. So one of the uh, practical things we do is set goals with them. Um, I have a graduate degree in theology, but I have an undergrad in psychology. So I do understand that there's a lot of brokenness that women are experiencing. Mm -hmm. So after we seek these women out and we're looking for them, um, we then set goals for them. Where do you want to go? What's in your way? What is impossible? Okay, great. How can we conquer that thing? And we continue to just dig deeper with them and have them set goals for themselves that are measurable. Because the more that they can meet a goal, the more they gain confidence, the more they have the courage to be what it is that they're designed to be. But we don't you know, just do the seeking and the goals, um, but we also give them opportunity. And I think that's so important in the church. You, know, you don't tell someone that they're just gifted and they should go out there and do it, but you tell them that there's a place for them here in the church. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking generations, like you guys are talking from a young girl to someone who's elderly, what role can you play here as a leader. So we try our best to give opportunities from opening doors to, to preaching at the pulpit. And it's just a passion of ours to do, but we do know we have to be intentional about it because it's not just something that's gonna happen on its own. I, I love that. Um, you know, as we're each talking and we all, I mean, I, I'm trying to think of something poetic to say, but we all sort of, we all flower from wherever our roots are planted, right? And so mm -hmm. when, when we talked about your mother when we signed on and it made me think of my mom and it made me think of the, the seeds that she planted in me that, that, you know, that, that whatever various path I've took to get here, you know, she bears, she and my father bear the, bear the, uh, um, the, get the credit, you know, for putting me on the path. And I'm, I'm endlessly grateful. I'm curious uh, for each of you, what, you know, because this is Habitat and because we've talked about, you know, acting in the world, Tell me a little bit about what home means to you. Um, what, let's maybe we'll start with you, uh, Pastor, again. Tell me a little bit, and we also shout out to your mother, you know, so mm -hmm. uh, maybe <laughs> tell me a little bit about what home means to you and what, what, uh, what you can lend to that uh, aspect. Yeah, I grew up in Tompkins Projects. Um, a fun mm. fact, it's like two blocks away from where Jay-Z grew up. So I like to always yeah. say that to let people know that I'm kind of cool, <laughs> just a little bit. Um, but I, yeah, I, I get, I got to get cool points wherever I can get them. Um, I grew up in a really tough neighborhood during a really tough time. And I remember my mom keeping my home as a place of refuge, as a, a place of safety. The way I best like to describe it is like soil where I was a seed and I was able to grow there and be myself and ask questions and continue to explore who I was. I didn't feel like I can do that in the outside world. In the outside mm. world, I had to be on my defense. I had to be prepared for anything. And there were so many um, just ad adverse things coming my way. But when I came into my home, I felt that peace. 
I felt like I could be myself. And I really do think that's what home is, a place where you're safe from harm, a place where you are safe from all of the things that are out there in the world that you cannot control. So for me, I guess refuge and a place of safety is how I would best describe it. That's, that's a great word, refuge. I love that. Yeah. Um, you know, it made me think of my own upbringing. I mean, when I think about my mom and dad and I had enough, had, we had a lot of uh, challenge, but boy, I knew I was loved and I knew that they were my biggest champions. And mm -hmm. anytime I stepped out of the way you know, or stepped off the path, they were the first there to tell me I was the one making a mistake and put me back on it. And I am ever grateful for that. Let me be clear. The strike was me. They were, you know. <laughs> I was, uh, 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 <laughs> payback is a bit of a bitch, as, it's, as they say, mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, um, Duana, tell me a little bit about, um, I loved what you said about the design of home around the physicality of home and how that impacts the family, but tell them, I'm really curious about what, what home means to you. Well, I, I mean, Demetria, really, Demetria just took my entire answer. <laughs> 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 She was the looking word, over your shoulder, huh? Clearly, she was in my brain. Um, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't agree with her more. And the word refuge is what I always use because that is exactly what I had, um, particularly when my mother purchased that home that I mentioned, our ranch style home in Atlanta. Mm. And it was well appointed. And so that is the goal that I have. We didn't have a lot, but she made a lot of what we had. Mm. And Love that it. is my goal with every home that, that we develop. And just to take it a little further, um, my mother has passed on, but my grandmother is still with me. She is 90 years old and her. more quick witted than me, um, just <laughs> runs circles around me. She was just here last year. We were touring and going around the Statue of Liberty. And so one thing I can say about my grandmother that really inspires me is that, and to take things further is she's a woman who, being 90 has seen a lot in terms of um, her ability to excel or not, or, or face hurdles in her uh, inability to excel um, in this country, but somehow she's, she found a way. And what she does is she carries with her that home from inside without. And that mm -hmm. allows me to go out into the world to not just um, carry the, the, the sense of refuge, the sense of an understanding of quality, how to appoint something well within your home, but to take that standard outside of your home and to set a standard for yourself that allows you to say, I'm limitless. I think what gives a child confidence in order to go out into the world to feel limitless is parenting, but also a physical, a built environment that gives them a sense of safety. Um, so I think that you can extend this idea of home, one that is healthy and whole um, for a child, into a broader concept that really sets them to um, onto a path of success based on what was around them. And so that's, I, th I think, what home means to me and, and the way that I, I view it now through my grandmother's lens. You know, the, when, when we're in New York and she comes to visit, you know, she's talking about things that, huh, well, you know, I wouldn't do this in my home. Why, why is this this way, you know, on the outside here? You know, mm -hmm. of course, all the, the trappings that we have in terms of trash and things like that. She just, you know, can't understand that. But you know, in other ways though, how we appoint schools, how we appoint our streets, um, how we appoint our, our civic organizations. So all, I think the idea of home extends beyond our, our actual physical home. I think you're right, that's great. You know, it makes me think of all of the, you know, the shoulders upon who, who we stand on so many shoulders, I swear, right? Um, mm -hmm. Gail, I'd like to go to you. I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm curious, you know, what is, I'm I'm so curious about, because I know, you know, I know a little, little, little bit about your current home situation. I know that you have, uh, you have impacted the lives of so many children in your home. I know that because I read it. So it's public knowledge and I was, but I didn't know it before then, but I'm just so curious about what home means to you, considering you are, as far as I can tell, almost never in it. Because you are at every <laughs> public event ever, all the time, no matter where. For it sure, is. for sure. I'm in it. Um, well, you know what I don't tell people is like you have Bloomberg, De Blasio, Corey Johnson, and Gail Brewer were all from Boston, but nobody wants anybody to know that. So I pretend I'm not. De Blasio <laughs> never stops talking about it. Bloomberg <laughs> stops talking about it. Corey Johnson never stops talking about it. I don't. They never stop talking. 
Um, <laughs> but really, I, I've been here since 1970, so that's a pretty long time. And mo I spent many, many years in what we call 82nd in Amsterdam, 80 Deuce is what we call it. And that was all through 70s, 80s, some of the 90s even. And that was a lot of drugs. But, you know, we, and I took all the kids in, you know, others did. One family had 17. We all took one. Or, you know, the kid whose mother was on crack, we took him in for like 20 years, et cetera. It was about 35 of them. And uh, so home, it's, you know, it could be it's so many different things. It's so many kids, I don't need to tell you, even today, it's not just the kids in the shelters that you hear about, but all the other ones that are couch surfing. And there's so yeah. many of them. There's just so many. So, um, I, you know, for me, it's uh, right now I'm on 95th Street. So I went all the way from, you know, we don't go too far, but when you change the grocery stores, like drama, you might as well be going. <laughs> I mean, I used to go back to the old deli because I couldn't imagine that there was another, you know, this is ridiculous. I walked 10 blocks to the deli for no reason, except I knew the deli. But we do that, you know. I lived in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and the 100s. That's as far as I got. And now I'm back to the 90s in terms of streets. So I would say home is, um, you gotta, in New York City, you gotta make something of it. You know, you're, um, you gotta be welcoming, city on the stoop. The street is often the home in a positive way. You know, it, it's, I like, I wish that more of that. I, I am really objecting to these new buildings that have a gym, a daycare center, like the whole building. So you never go to the rec center. You never leave the building for mm -hmm. anything. If I had my way, I'd tell these new developers, I'm sorry, Tawana, I hope I'm not talking out of turn here. <laughs> I would tell these new developers, Karen knows me, both of the Karens know me. I would tell them, you can't have a pool. You can't have mm -hmm. a rooftop. You can't have any of that stuff. Because guess what? Right down the street, there's a rec center, blah, blah, blah. And you might actually meet some of your neighbors. So, yeah. you know, that's a, that, that's a concern. I call them gated communities vertical. Because yeah. that's what wow. they are. Yeah. I'm very yeah. upset about them, to be honest with you. So anyway, to me, the home is what the, like I said, it's the grocery store, it's the rec center, it's the, you know, it's the park. It's, it's all that package, which is why it's so important um, coming out of this pandemic, because we all use them during the pandemic, I think. Yeah. And, and we need to continue to make them accessible and not have people stay within their, you know, I I love that. Gail, you know, thank you for sharing that because we're, I'm really on a, a tear about neighboring. And some of that is, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to get to you, Karen, in one second here, but I want to hear from you. But it's neighboring is such, it's so fundamental to who we mm -hmm. are. And you learn that, hopefully, you learn that by experience. I mean, my story is I had significant loss. I lost my partner some years ago. And when we moved into our house, I gave zero thought. It was in Michigan, but um, I gave zero thought to who lived beside me, except that they kept their lawns neat, right? And when Trudy got sick, and uh, it, those neighbors saved my behind so in mm. so many ways, and I gave them zero thought. And hopefully, um, that has made me a better neighbor. I know all of my neighbors now, uh, and and we work out together in our parking garage, you know, and we <laughs> through the pandemic, and we. You know, we, I brought a, a bushel of apples back and we leave it in the lobby and we try and create a sense of community. And, I, and I'm yeah. so, so grateful. I learned that from hard won experience. And um, it's such a fundamental part. And we, a lot of the communities we work with in New York City are about, we think of these community centers as an extension of their living room, especially for mm. aging populations, right? You know, if, if you're in a smaller apartment and you, you need to get out and maybe you are, you know, so anyway, it's uh, thank you for calling that out because it is so central to the four walls and a you know uh, or and the and and the building that you're in is the assets that you're around the place where you call home. So Karen, enough about me. Yeah. Let's uh, let's uh, let's hear. I'd love to hear more about uh, uh, more about your experience of home. Yeah, well, this is such a rich conversation, and certainly we know that there's over I think nineteen thousand single mothers with children under six that are living in poverty where home uh, is something that, you know, they are trying to have. And um, uh, kudos to you, Karen, and Habitat, and certainly the leadership that Gail has shown 
over decades in the city and to Dewana who's doing housing because, you know, we need more affordable housing so that people are able to create homes. Um, and and uh, certainly Demetra gave the best of the best answers, but I'll just throw in um, a story. Um, we have two daughters. Um, our oldest Jasmine isn't, both are engineers, but our oldest Jasmine uh, was an, an engineer for Microsoft and she was out in uh, their headquarters in Redmond. And um, when the pandemic hit, um, you'll remember one of the first cases was out in Washington state. And it was only like a couple of miles from the headquarters and where she lived. And when they were shutting down, her manager said, okay, we're gonna shut down and Jasmine, you can you know, work from home and you know, we'll keep you apprised. And she was just like, we, we're gonna work remote. And, she, and he said, yes. And she says, well, I live in an apartment here in Bellevue. I'm going home to Brooklyn to be with my family. And she got her little self, you know, she packed up herself and her, her uh, uh, our grand pup, Oscar, who's a French <laughs> bulldog. And they got on a plane and came to Brooklyn. And she's been working from my dining room table for a year and a half, but it seems like she'll be going back out West in the next couple of months. But for me, the fact that we have created a place, a space for which she knows it is home, despite the fact that she had this beautifully adorned two bedroom apartment. Mm -hmm. um, for her, home was where we were back in Brooklyn, where she could feel safe and know that she would be cared for and know that despite you, know, you having this great job across the country, you wanna be home where your family is. Uh, when 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 things start popping off, and, oh, that's amazing. And you know that is we have to. We've all we're all keenly aware of the toll that the pandemic has taken, and so it. I think it's important that we also look at the blessings that are that are yeah. being to it for those of us who are fortunate, because yeah. God knows, well, you know what the saying is that we're not all we're clearly not all in the same boat, but we are all that's in the right. same storm. Um, and so, it, you know, that is a lovely story about, and what a wonderful memory for you to have um, your daughter at home during that period of time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's such a unique time. I want to, this is usually sort of a throwaway, and we're coming to the end of our hour, so I want to be a little vigilant, but this is usually such a throwaway question, but this is such a unique time in our history. You know, um, I think, Gail, you said, you know, God knows the new normal, whatever this new normal is. I, I really don't like that term. I feel like it's like called to say air quotes around it, but, you know, given that we are in this space where we clearly, hope, hopefully, we will be something different than what we were before in a myriad of different ways. And so this question feels less of a throwaway to me. If you could wave a magic wand, you know, mm -hmm. and make, you know, and make something different, um, you know, in the going forward, there's so, I mean, there's so many ways we could all go there. I mean, I think yesterday was a, a particular anniversary in the, um, when I think about that, you cannot call out uh, George Floyd, without mentioning George Floyd, and hopefully this is some kind of critical turning point in the issue of race in America, and um, that's one of mine, you know, um, certainly I have housing needs that I wish I could wave a magic wand and, and around, but I'm curious about your points of view around, you know, in the, around a magic wand. What is it that you think would be a profound thing that we could sprinkle a little fairy dust on and maybe make it, make it different? Who, does anyone want to feel called to take that first, or am I going to pick on somebody? I was, I'm. I'll, 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 okay. I'll jump, I'll jump first. And certainly yesterday was uh, uh, an important day, but um, from a personal perspective, um, I had the privilege of working at Pfizer, being a leader at Pfizer for 22 years, where one of our businesses is around cancer. And uh, two years ago, next month, um, my mom was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer and she's getting the best of care at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And as we know, cancer is the second leading cause of death in the world. And this year alone, there'll be more than 10 million people in the, um, in the, in the world who will die 
from cancer. And so with um, seeing how mommy is battling, certainly if I had a magic wand, it would certainly be to help our researchers at Pfizer and around the world that are trying to find a cure for cancer because our society is truly impacted in ways um, big and small. And so um, as we look this year, there'll be 2 million new cases uh, here in the US um, of people diagnosed with cancer and over 600,000 deaths. And so that's what I would wait a wand uh, to kind that's of That's a fix. really good wand. I know that, I know without even asking that we have all been mm -hmm. touched by cancer. I know I have. Um, and by loss that results. So Godspeed and all prayers to your mother and her battle. She is, uh, she's got some mighty angels on her side. Um, so um, Gail, I'm curious about your, about your magic wand. I don't know. I think, I mean, obviously the mental illness, that's just one, I, mm -hmm. you know, Karen makes a perfect point too, but this mental illness, I don't know if it's habit, you know, the, the, the issue of uh, habitating through the pandemic or not, or if there's just, uh, uh, you know, I hate to say number 45, I don't know. Or if it's just people, uh, I don't know. I mean, and, and it's not, we're not dealing with it despite efforts. So it, it's, uh, I just got calls today. I get calls from people wearing yarmulkes and I get calls from the Asian community, literally scared to walk down the street because of its mental illness. Mm. People mm. for no reason just acting uh, in an irrational way. So that's number one. The second one, I just want to mention the issue of education because mm -hmm. it's, just, it's just not working. And I don't know, I'm not an educator. I do what I can for funding. I do what I can for uh, supporting the parents, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's, it's just not, we're not where we should be on education and we just lost a whole year. Yeah. So now the question is what's, what one, in addition to cancer, which is so important, what one could be and I think they kind of go together because I have been bugging the Department of Education to put a social worker in every school. Mm. And now there's some more money for that. But is it culturally appropriate? Is it going to be somebody there full time? Are they going to do social emotional? Are there language barriers? Are there all those above It's social emotional? So and I think that might help with the other that I just described. But um, social emotional and education do go together. But we have to improve both. I, I, that would be my one of my wands. That's 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 a, another mighty wand, Duana. I'm gonna. That's a, a couple of hard acts to follow, but um, but you know it is a magic wand, so it gets you know it can be all powerful. Well, I I mean both Karen and Gail's answers are just wonderful and spot on. We've all been affected by by cancer. I think I mentioned my mother's passed on and to cancer um, mm -hmm. and so many of us have been affected by it um, so that would be just an amazing one to, to, to spread to sprinkle um, over the earth and then mental illness also is just such a good one if you've been walking around New York City um, definitely people of for certain um, it's certain communities that it's scale mentioned have been affected but I know I have walked around and have experienced some incidents over the past 15 months that really given me pause that did not pre-pandemic give me pause. Um, so we really need to double down on our supportive services for people. Um, I don't know what happened, but it has really shed a light on, on what the work that needs to be done. So I, I think, so on top of those huge things, that would be great given, as you mentioned, Karen, um, the one year anniversary of the George Floyd, George Floyd's death, I, if I could wave a wand, I would love to root out whatever and cure whatever um, the issue is that causes black men to be disproportionately um, mm -hmm. killed or injured at the hands of the police. Um, I think that a level of humanization needs to be um, be felt. Um, I don't know what people see when they see us. I'm an African American woman, obviously. Yeah. Um, but if there could be a level of humanization that could be experienced from the sprinkling of the wand, I think that would go a long way, as well as obviously other policies and initiatives to help people. But I think some of it just starts in the heart. And yeah. yes. if we could impact people's hearts and minds and their perceptions, um, that would do away with a lot of the senseless killings that we see. Um, That's tremendous. I saw yesterday with Anthony Green's um, video. 
I just saw that yesterday. So that, that's yeah. what I was doing. Yeah, the um, identify, don't compare is something that somebody told me, taught me early on. You know, try not to compare yourself to people, but identify with them and find the places mm. where we are more alike than we are different. And um, and it's because we are more alike than we are different. And it's, um, but I, and I think with the issue of this issue of race, it's about reckoning with the owning the truth of it you know you, you know in re in the recovery circles it's you you can't recover until you acknowledge that there's a problem right. i think you know that's it right. has to start with it has to start with acknowledgement of the problem and that's so that's my ma magic wand but i purposefully left the the the, the faith magic wand for uh, <laughs> the pastor because i feel uh i feel the need for some uh, uh for some divine inspiration to to lead us into this new normal yeah, I absolutely love um, the words that Doana said about the heart, because I think that really is a key part that we just can't ignore. And even in all the systemic injustice, it goes back to the heart and what's going on in a person. And I think if I had this wand to wave, it would be for people to know that change is not enough. We need transformation. That has been something really big that we've been saying at Legacy and I'm hoping other churches is more of a, as I say those words, change is reversible. It can go back. It can do some mm. things again. We need mm. transformation and we have to know that within us, transformation is possible. So one of the biggest things I think that everyone should understand is that those small steps matter, right? Take a step in some place that you are being called to, but these small steps lead to transformation. So to just be obedient to where you're calling to women in particular, um, you know, I'm, I'm reminded that sometimes you're not invited through a door, but just because you're not invited doesn't mean that you cannot knock, right? These, there are opportunities for you to get through and understand that you can be a work of transformation. So if it were up to me, that's what I would hope would be in the hearts of many people. That is amazing. Here, here. I know that we all agree. Well, we've come to the top of our hour, but I want to encourage our uh, members of the audience. If you have a story that you'd like to share, please share it in the chat. Um, and uh, and I'll give you a little more instruction around that. We'll close out with the more instruction. But just as a last word for the panelists, um, I want to make sure if you have something coming up that we should be aware of, something that you want to share. Um, is there something that you want to shout out? Um, can I start with you, Karen? What's coming up? Uh, what's coming up in your world that we should be aware of? Where should we be looking for you? Well, it's not really for me, but it is really, really important. And it gets to a lot of these issues that we talked about. And New York City is having elections uh, in June, June 22nd, or the New York City elections and early voting begins June 12th. And we have this new thing called ranked choice voting. Um, and so it's just really, really important that we understand how that process works. And, um, and we all show up because our city, unlike never before, is really at a point where uh, we have some major challenges and that's all kind of making our voices heard at the ballot box is really critical. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. If we have learned nothing, please let us learn that your vote counts, that politics yes. is inherently local and that your vote counts. Good Lord, your vote counts, please. Um, Gail, can't have to go to you. We're talking about voting and politics. Oh. What, where can people, where should people be watching uh, uh, for you next? Well, K Karen is right about the voting. I can't say it any better. I will say, just to give an example on the census, we were and are only 89 people uh, could have been counted, and then we would not have lost a member of Congress. Each member of Congress, Karen knows this better than I, brings in, I don't know, a billion or two yeah. every year mm -hmm. for our subways and our houses. And 89 people. And so, you know, we all tried. I could I could put blame, but I'll leave it off this particular conversation. Um, I know exactly where to put the blame, but I'll leave it off. Um, what, <laughs> What I'm, what I'm saying, though, in terms of just generally, you know, whether it's your community board or your civic organization, please get involved because that was, and then I know in Boston, one woman just won her election by one vote. So, you know, mm. you just really have to uh, be present. And I think this new norm, and I hate that word also, yeah. it's definitely about being present and having your voice heard 
and, and it shouldn't be the loudest. It should be the people who are in the trenches and have the most to contribute. As the Reverend said, you know, you, the doors, you make that door open, walk into it. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And particularly the women who are, for instance, uh, members of your single parent households who are, who are so terrific that they uh, manage to get a home ownership, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess what I'm saying is one more thing. There's a new statue that I had a lot to do of all the suffragists in Central Park. Yeah, uh, I had a lot to do with that. And and so please go see it. It's got Sojourner Truth and Katie and uh, the other Susan B, as we call them. That and is so they're all, they're all there. And um, it took us five years, but we did it. And go see them. Come on, come on back. New York City is going to be happy to have you. I, uh, we were talking about that, the group of us yesterday on a different string. But, you know, come on back to New York City. Joanna and then, uh, and then uh, Pastor, I'll end with you again. Joanna, what's up? For, what, what, where can we find you? Well, I, well, one place that I think people can find me as well as um, other developers is if you're seeking affordable housing, particularly, um, we, we're finishing up a development that is for home ownership, which is often something you don't see. Typically, a lot of affordable housing is for rentals. Yeah. These are affordable townhouses in Brooklyn. So and we're uh, in, under the lottery system now. So if you're interested, not just in the development, but another develop, any other development being offered um, through the city of New York, I would suggest you go to housingconnect.com um, to sign up for the lottery for this development in Brooklyn or for any of the others um, that are both rentals and, and, and homes. But that's what I would suggest for the audience. If somebody asked me, I would say that uh, Duana and Debar and Habitat for Humanity in New York City are going to be developing something together focused on home ownership. That's what I that's my what I say. Demetra, um, you want to close us up? Where can we? Where should we be? We're looking for you. Yes, I'm very excited to announce that Legacy has been partnering with a lot of other churches because we want to come together. Like you said, we're more alike than different. So you will find me partnering with Wellspring Church. And we're doing a series called Her Voice. So if there's any ladies out there who are trying to figure out how to use your voice, whether it's in any, you know, at home, whether it's in the workplace, this is a series for you. So please join us. You can look on Legacy's Facebook page, Instagram page for uh, the links to get there because it's a valuable part of what the world needs. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very interesting series. I cannot thank each of you enough for, uh, for giving of yourselves to be with us for this conversation. Um, I know we're all busy and we have other things coming, but I'm telling you, I could, have, I could sit here for another hour and talk about all the things that we left unsaid in the cracks. So um, on behalf of Habitat for Humanity, on my, my board, my staff, and most importantly, the mostly women, 90% women that make up our Habitat for Humanity homeowners, I wanna thank each of you um, for being with us today. Um, the panelists, thank you, thank you, thank you, um, thank you to people in the audience. Thank you. We have a networking event coming up. So if there's an opportunity to share your story and stay with us, let me read some of the business of doing business because if I freewheel this, I'll miss some of the vital stuff. So um, first, I'm supposed to thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I'm now I'm supposed to say, uh, join us in the watch party rooms. Um, from 12 until 1, there'll be a virtual watch party rooms. Um, special shout out to two watch party rooms in particular, Kendra Scott and Concordia are the hosts. Um, they're hosting their own watch party rooms. Uh, one, uh, Concordia's room features a conversation on self-improvement and uh, Kendra is doing one on styling. Um, all you have to do is minimize the chat box and click on join the watch party room if you are in the audience. So just minimize the chat box and click on join the watch party room. We encourage each of you to join. There's a number of watch party rooms. Um, try and join one that has less than 10 guests um, so that everyone will have a chance to connect. And uh, I will bounce around in those watch party rooms and, and see some of you there. Again, ladies, thank you so much for you. You know, these kind of events, I hope in, are an inspiration to those in the audience. I can tell you that speaking personally, you breathe life into the challenges that we face every day. So I am stronger because of the conversations uh, that we had here today and the degree to which you shared of yourselves. And so thank you for that. Um, and uh, thank you. And I, and I look forward to seeing each of you individually, certainly you, Gail, sooner than later, and, uh, 
individually and, and, and hopefully in person. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. This was fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Bye, everybody. Everybody, Thank have a good you. Day.